<laughs> hey everyone thank you phil part in part one we're back like i said part two of course it's the big 100th episode but of course it's also a scarlet spider episode so fortunately matt can't be with us but i've crossed the international time and space barrier and i'm here with ray hey how you going phil i always uh, hope everyone is enjoying themselves Oh, not too much. Uh, but <laughs> yes, we're all good. And since Lilf and I already covered the issue, Amazing 400 with J.M.D. Mateus, uh, Ray and I are going to talk about our talk we had over on his podcast. You know, you know that podcast, Into the Night. The Moon Knight the- Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's the uh, only time that I hear it pronounced properly is on your podcast. I, I hear you on your show, Trey. <laughs> I got to pronounce it correctly. Like, into the night. Deep, 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 deep. That's in my head every time, but I've got to restrain myself. <laughs> and now I've got a new stinger to put okay. at the beginning. Yeah. Be a lot of fun. So, yeah. So, uh, what was that? A couple months ago. Yeah. You and I talked to uh, Terry Cavanaugh and Howard Mackey all about the. Moon Knight and the Clone Saga. Mm. They were really, really accommodating. Um, uh, they took their time. And actually, it was originally meant to just be a chat with Terry Kavanagh, but he he gets on so well. He's good mates with Howard Mackey. He actually got back to me saying, oh, how would you like it if Howard Mackey joined? And, you know, big name. I'm going, uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be cool. <laughs> so uh yeah so they both came on and and they were both really yeah they they really did spend the time didn't they phil um yeah and they were happy to talk about anything we talked about the the clone saga stuff but we obviously covered stuff for for moon knight uh terry kavanagh had a stint there towards the end of mark specter moon knight and and howard had he had the one issue uh issue 25 so it was good to kind of tie that in together um But then, yeah, but then we got into the Clone Saga, which was a very interesting, uh, apart from also as well, a lot of talk about the inner machinations of working in the Marvel office. Like We spoke to them about that as well. But, yeah, no, the uh, the Clone Saga stuff was was really riveting stuff. So you were... uh... You were nice enough to cut up some of these, uh, some clips of what we talked about, uh, Clone Mm -hmm. Saga-wise. So uh, should we play some of these and then discuss this? Yeah. All right. So you have the first one. You have uh, origin of the new clone saga. So I assume this is them talking about how it all came about. Mm-hmm. All right. All right, everyone. Here we go. But let, let's go to the clone saga. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Where do you want to start, Phil, with this? All well, Howard. Oh, wait, I, wait. I, I can start very quickly. Uh, uh, all Howard. Howard Paul. <laughs> no, no, no. no, 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 it's all Terry's fault. <laughs> no. Unless you love it, I, and if you I, love it, I'm a genius. Yeah. I I pitched a story called the Crone Saga involving uh, a man and Howard Miss, <laughs> and then you saw what happened. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I love the story, but I mean, or thank you. I, 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 <laughs> I've always heard what it was supposed to be like a two or three month story, but like the sales department was just like, keep it going. This is, you know, this and X Men are what's really selling right now. Keep this going. Keep this going. It, yes. it was, it was meant, it, there were five Spider Man titles, I believe, and it was meant to span, correct four, me if I'm wrong, four, 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 four titles meant to span five months. Mm-hmm. Uh, no. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't mean to, because I have the. I still have the the original notebook. Um, See, where, where, that's because it was all your idea. <laughs> yeah. No, because I write. Uh, <laughs> and it was. It, there were four titles, and we planned it out of, to go for three months, so okay. that it would be a story arc. And our theory at the time was three times four is twelve. That's the equivalent of a year's worth of stories. Mm, and mm. so we really had it it paced out that way and then what what did happen my recollection was that was right around where we started to have a couple of things in the industry one we were becoming much more of a a corporate entity and mm. marketing had much more of an influence on on the comics than they had prior to that and 
there was the beginnings of the the comic book sales downturn. And we had been tasked with coming up with, you know, it was our turn. We had to come up with a a big Spider-Man crossover. And yeah, Carrie, Carrie is the one who, did, I mean, we're all joking aside, he came up with the original uh, concept. He, he pitched it to me the night before our meeting. And um, I, I loved it. And so we, we brought, brought it in, but towards the end of that, those three months, you are correct in that at a time when everything was going down in terms of sales, including the X-Men, Spider-Man was not. Spider-Man w- was rising and then at least holding steady. So marketing stepped in and said, you can't, the, the reason is because of this story. And so you can't end the story. And I remember mm-hmm. at one point I said, then you don't understand how story works. <laughs> because <laughs> story has a beginning, middle and an end. And we know what the end is. Yeah. And that, that was, for me, that was a big part of the issue of what, there was never supposed to be a clone saga. This was supposed to be the second clone story and and play out over three months. And then it just, it got, it was basically taken away. The decisions were taken away from the writers or we had to try to work within um, uh, constraints that were put on us above above not only above the writers but actually above editorial so that that's my recollection tara what do you what do you well, remember to clarify a couple of things i have read a lot uh since then that we were tasked with coming up with something that would compete with the death of superman i mm-hmm. have no memory of that ever happening so that's interesting i mean first i was like wait a minute i think that only three to five months because I mean, you haven't heard it yet, but when me and Lil talked to J.M.D. Mateus, he was like, "Oh yeah, it's supposed to be like six months to a year." But then, oh. but then he, but then I think uh, Howard just said, "You know, they figured, you know, tw- twelve issues or that's, that's like the equivalent of a year." So, yeah, it's really it's really interesting that um, that Terry and well, I guess Terry and Howard's like saying that Terry um, came up with the concept, but the concept seemed to be quite uh, quite firm, but then having it. Uh, n- I don't want to say bastardized, but uh, really with this push of, like, can you imagine the whole uh, comic industry, there's a big trend of it kind of taking a dip and uh, and you've only got this one golden goose being Spider-Man uh, and, and it being all corporatized. And so them having the pressure to actually make this thing uh, bigger than what it was actually originally conceived to be. Because as, as Howard mentions, it was only meant to be like the second clone story it was never meant to kind of blow out to be such a big thing uh, so it's really interesting to find out like the origins of how this all started uh when we did the read through so far with uh with the ben riley issues and stuff you can kind of see you can kind of see them kind of it's almost as if they're thinking aloud as to uh how how we like you know how are we going to stretch this out oh yeah let's drop in a maybe it's maybe it's better maybe it isn't you know maybe it, it, it does have that really that that feel to it but i i i mean i'm enjoying it um, i don't know about you feel like is it is it a different experience enjoying it now than when you first read it or are you still kind of have still got that kind of same reaction to it i mean it's it's in, i think it's more enjoyable now just because you know you know where the beginning is and you know the a definitive ending you know back then you're just like oh is, when is this going to end how is this going to end because they keep teasing maybe you know, Peter isn't the real Peter, and mm. yeah, and, and it is interesting as well. They did mention the death of Superman, which Terry totally denies. But this is, isn't this? I mean, we've mentioned it before, right? Or, or it might have been in some of the other episodes that of the shows that you've done, Phil. This was around the same time as was it around the same time as Nightfall as well? Like uh, Batman, uh, it was. <laughs> oh, you're. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. Um, right after both of those, because Death of Superman was 1992, Nightfall was 93, and then I think oh, right, okay. now, right now in a read, we're at 94. So, yeah, it's pretty much back to back to back. So, it would, I mean, I mean, although Terry does <laughs> deny it, I mean, there, there is, you can't, you can't ignore the fact of, I guess, the success of, of Nightfall as well. So, 
it being the industry going down, but also your major competitor doing so well with their flagship title, I guess it makes sense that the corporate Marvel decided to, okay, hey, guys, let's um, let's amp it up a bit. I mean, yeah, I mean, the 90s were the age of the event. I mean, even like I was saying, the big, you know, the big two at Marvel then were Spider-Man and X-Men. And I don't, if they weren't doing it yet, they were getting close to doing Age of Apocalypse for X-Men, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. It was around the 90s, right, Phil, that they were, I mean, you're saying it's the age of the event and it certainly is, but it, it's kind of, I, I feel, when they were finding their feet or discovering how how lucrative events could be. Um because like you look at today's standards as well, like events just happen constantly and, and on a regular basis. Um, whereas in the nineties, they did pop up, but it was almost as if kind of like testing the waters. Mm. Um, uh, if you look at the Infinity Saga, uh, 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 that certainly was. I mean, Infinity Gauntlet. I think Infinity War was a direct reaction to the Infinity Gauntlet, right? The success of that, and then it's like, well, we can't finish it there because Magus is like the evil side of Adam. We've got to show the good side of him as well. So let, let's like kind of see if we can bleed this um, for as, as much or milk this cow as much as it's as worth. I think um, it's just like the evolution of the business because, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, we can get more events these days. But I was just thinking, oh, yeah, the 90s were like, you know, the foil covers, the hologram covers, mm. all the special covers. But these days you get, you know, 50 variant covers. So it's, you know. What what do you prefer? I mean, I guess the, your wallet would prefer one, um, but what would you prefer, Phil? Would you prefer the the lenticular, the embossed, the glow in the dark covers, or do you prefer these variant covers? I mean, maybe it's just the nineties kid in me, but I like all the special, you know, lenticular and holographic covers because, like, variants. I really don't buy a lot of different variant covers. Usually, it's usually just like one cover. You know, sometimes I might get the var- one of the variant covers, but I usually just buy one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, me too. I mean, well, maybe Moon Knight might be an exception. I have been getting exceptions all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like your favorites and stuff. Um, but I'm kind of like you again, Phil. Like we're very, you know, triplets. Two, two of the two of the three pods, right? So, <laughs> um, very similar with you. Uh, but various I find are fun in the fact that to say some titles that you do collect that you know that you you can give a bit of flex to i like to like pick up the odd variant because just because i love the cover like you know compared to the regular uh, there's a little bit of me going oh shit i've got to get the oh sorry i've got to get the regular issue because it's it's the real <laughs> issue yeah, yeah. but but I do like the variant covers, especially if they're – and there's so many of them. There can be so many of them that it's really nice to actually just be able to pick and choose. And I've done that with the Ghost Rider, the Ed Brisson series, Ghost Rider 1. I went against the regular cover because I thought, oh, man, this variant looks bloody kick-ass. I'm going to go for that one instead. Uh, yeah, so stuff like that. Um, and, and more recently, actually, for the Spider-Woman, the Legacy issue 100, the uh, issue five, um, I just went for something that I just liked. Like, you know, I just got like the look of it. And I don't have the money now to, to be able to buy the 37 different covers that <laughs> that come out. Um, but, yeah. I mean, yeah, like I, I think I said in the feedback I sent you guys, I was surprised that that, uh, that Spider-Woman, you know, for the legacy numbering is 100, that it wasn't bigger. I thought they were they would have went all out to, you know, just the – put out like a bigger way bigger issue and do like mm. the, the variants and stuff yeah i mean they've never been short i mean just on a side tangent with the spider woman thing they've never been short of on their variants which has been really really great um i'm not sure whether um i mean variants are obviously for a push right to, to, to boost the sales oh yeah um yeah but uh i'm not sure what what the metric is to pick the particular title to do it. I mean, for me and, and for spider woman fans, it's great because you do get all these covers, but, um, and this was before even the movie was announced. Well, actually the movie hasn't been announced officially yet, even as well. We're talking about Olivia Wilde doing a, a Sony film. Like she doesn't say, but like, um, it's interesting that they pick spider woman. That, uh, that's all I'm kind of saying. It's, it's a strange pick to, to give like 30 odd variants to, um, so I wonder what the the thinking is behind that. If we're if we're to look at the corporate side of Marvel, as to what why they pick the certain characters, um, it's not doesn't seem to be necessarily connected to the MCU. 
Mm, not yet, and I just wonder if you know if it she has spider in her name. If people are if they behind the yeah, like, ah, people people might think oh Spider Man Spider Woman. Uh. Yeah, yeah. The the Iron Man one Phil that came out, which was highly anticipated. Um, did that have many variants? I can't remember. Like uh, I can't remember. I know it had a few. It um I can't remember how many. Wouldn't have had thirty though, wouldn't it? I it wouldn't have had. I don't think. Yeah, yeah, because Iron Man is a pretty big property at the moment for Marvel, you'd think, because because Robert Downey Jr., MCU, all that sort of stuff. I think they I think they're saving like the huge, huge you know, number of variants for like special issues now. Like you know, like if you get mm. one hundred or two hundred or nine hundred. Yeah. <laughs> or if you I think, like, because I may think also as well that the big, the big event for Marvel was the Jonathan Hickman mutants and X titles. I mean, that's been a big boon. Yeah, you know, the return of the X X Men, like, because obviously we all know the fact that because of the uh, the the Fox ownership of the 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 properties in the film side, Marvel all of a sudden just killed off all the titles. You know, or had a, a very low run of the titles, and now they're back back with a bang. Uh, coincidentally, when they they have the properties back, um, but yeah, I'm sure that had a lot of a lot of um, variants as well. So I'm trying to remember who we talked to. What was it? it uh, there was one of the writers. Was it Kelly Thompson? It was someone who said, "Because I said, you know, did they just come up with things if they, you know if they're going to be in a TV show or a movie?" <laughs> Yeah. Oh, rub it, rub it in, Phil. Out of the the thousands of creators that you managed oh, to chat with, anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Carla, come on. Yeah, that's cool. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I guess sometimes you know that might become in the sum of it, but I guess not all the time. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, tying it back to um, what we hear from Terry and and how it it is interesting how the business run. Uh, is run there is a sense as well that terry and howard um they were fortunate enough to have worked um pre corporatization of, of marvel so that they certainly have their uh, preferences of how things were back in the day a large a large lot of it um is to do with i guess the the editors as well that they did mention um which aren't in the snippets here but uh, about um the great mark grunwald Mm. And how he used to run things, which was it sounded like a lot of fun, but uh, then it sounded like corporate kind of snuffed out a lot of the fun as well, which is a shame. Is that in this second clip uh, about the original Clone Saga and the pitch about it and everything? Mm -hmm. Oh right. yeah, I can't. Yeah, we'll see. All right, well here, let's see. What What was very interesting to me about that original story is it was two good people in a bad situation. It was not, he was not a traditional villain, the clone, because he was a clone of Peter Parker. So he was a good guy. Yeah. And that then they fought. And then the clone, I'm using air quotes, fell down the air shaft at or the, the big chimney. At Con Ed. Yeah. 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 The smokestack and was dead. And then Spider Man was swinging across town. He had the envelope with the results of the test that would establish whether he was the clone or the real one from Kurt Connors. And then he, remembered how much he real he loved Mary Jane and he tore it up believing that only a real person could love that much and not a clone. Mm -hmm. So that story had always stuck with me as a really strong, impactful story because of the two good guys in a bad situation. So now, however many years later, I'm grown up or as grown up as I ever got to be. Um, and we're having this meeting and we had found ourselves in a situation where as the writers grew up and got married and bought apartments or homes and had mortgages, etc. We started writing that to Spider-Man that way. He married the most beautiful, successful model in town. They bought a penthouse apartment and we, we had slowly but steadily written him away from our target audience. You know, it wasn't something that most of our readers could, could identify with because most of them were not married to the most beautiful, successful model mm. in town. They might aspire to be, but they were not. Um, so uh, that's sort of a situation we found ourselves in. Again, we were not tasked by editorial or anyone else to fix that problem. But Howard and I did talk all the time. We were writing two different Spider-Man titles, and we would play off each other and discuss things. And 
we knew we w- had written ourselves into a corner with this character and it was a difficult corner to work from. And I remembered that story and I thought, okay, if we bring that character back and he has never finished school, he's certainly not married. We've effectively brought Spider-Man back to where we want him to be without having him get a divorce or having his wife die. And now he's a widower, which would just add more baggage to the character Mm. rather than we wanted some organic way to get back to the character that we knew the audience loved best and without adding more baggage. We felt there was too much baggage already on there with the marriage and the mortgage and all that. Mm. So that led me to think of that original story, how we could use that. Howard was very receptive to it receptive of it the minute I pitched. I don't actually think I pitched it to you the day before, Howard. I think we 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 played around with it for quite a while. And the intention, just to clarify what it was, at the end of that story arc, the clone was going to be revealed as the real Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Spider-Man, the current Spider-Man, who was married to Mary Jane, they were going to learn that Mary Jane was pregnant. And in following his character... With great power comes great responsibility. Peter would realize his responsibility now was to his family. And they would be Mm -hmm. written off to the sunset with a happy ending. We certainly didn't want a a bad ending and have him die or anything for all the readers that had been reading his adventures for 20 years. Um, He would have a happy ending. It would be a good ending. He'd be out there in the Marvel Universe. He could be used again. But now we would have a Spider-Man in place who was single hadn't finished school and we could get back to the basic roots of the character. And when, when, and then Howard did force me to give the pitch at the meeting, (laughs) but everybody was talking about different things and it seemed to be going in a different direct direction. And finally Howard not being man enough to do it himself said, well, Perry has an idea and (laughs) made me stand up in front of the class and say the idea. And I remember Mark DeMattis specifically originally saying, well, no, we just did LMDs of Peter's parents and we did all this and it'd just be another sort of fake thing. And I said, well, no, actually, uh, the end result would be this is the real one. And now we got him back to his roots. Mm -hmm. Suddenly everyone in the room was all over it and loved it, except the editor. The Mm -hmm. editor was a little nervous about this. And so we knew it had to be pitched to the editor in chief. We made him promise not to speak to the editor in chief until the editor in chief got to the meeting the next day and we would pitch it to him because we would pitch it from a more positive standpoint than the editor who was not really all that into it. Um, He did promise. And then the next day the editor in chief showed up and in fact, the editor had talked to him about it (laughs) and, and sort of poisoned his mind a little bit about it. And so that was Tom DeFalco, the editor in chief. His initial resistance was, this just sounds like we're doing the Bobby scene from Dallas where, you know, Pam wakes up, Bobby's in the shower, and the whole last year didn't really happen. And I was able to point out that, no, it's nothing like that. It Everything did happen. Everything that yeah. Reader read did happen to this character. It just wasn't the actual character they thought it was, but he's a real character. Mm. And now what we've got is a clone who will have more gravitas and impact and weight in the universe because he's got 20 years of backstory. So he's not just a dismissed clone. And we've added another layer to Spider-Man. And again, to Tom DeFalco's credit, he heard that and he said, you're right. Yeah, let's do it. And we all left that meeting with the intention that that storyline was going to end with Ben Riley taking on, taking back his life as Peter Parker and Spider-Man. And that's how it was going to end. That yeah. changed. Yeah. <clears throat> I think he summed mm-hmm. up perfectly. You're asking me my thoughts on the clone saga. I think that's why I had like mixed feelings because I, th- I thought, okay, it's pretty cool that, you know, Ben Riley is going to be revealed to be the real Peter Parker. But also it's like, I'd been reading since like 1988, like not too long after they got married. And I'm like, I like the marriage. I liked him being married to Mary Jane. And like, you could even, even back then I could tell it's like, Oh, you know, some, at least some of them don't like that marriage and they want to get rid of it. And yeah. Yeah. It's, um, 
It's a strange one, isn't it? <laughs> like just listening to this as well and not not um, having read the whole clone saga through as well, it does get kind of really complicated as to what um, eventuates. So, so Terry was saying basically that from a certain point, from the first clone, the clone story, that the smokestack and all that as well, that we find that actually the clone is the one that goes to with Mary Jane and they go forward, right? And they have the marriage and they do all that, right? And well, and yeah, that, that that's the plan because yeah, remember, yeah, like, I think when we first talked, you, you know, after that first battle, you know, there was an explosion. One Spider Man's awake, one appears to be dead, and you know, the yeah. life drops the dead one down the smokestack, and then yeah. the one goes to Kurt Connors to get tested, but then he doesn't look at the results because he's like, oh, I feel these feelings, yes. Mary Jane, I must be the real one, but it's like. So he didn't look so. He he had no positive proof that he was the real Spider Man. So yeah, so no. he swings off and be with Mary Jane. So it's like, but that was meant. So so Terry was saying his pitch was that was actually the clone. Yeah, and, uh, and that would have yeah. um, because it, it's so interesting to hear that that for them would solve a lot of things. Like as Terry was saying about he and Howard had painted Peter Peter or Spider Man into a corner of alienating all these listeners, oh, not listeners, I think all these readers about um, Spider-Man, you know, the marriage, the mortgage, all that sort of stuff. It's nothing that they want. It's, and it's so interesting as well because it's funny. Like, as a writer, that's what you do, right? I mean, if they're going through that in their lives, the best the best resource to, to grab is is from your own experience. So they, they obviously put that into Spider-Man, but uh, – it seemed that the the readership wasn't really into it. I, I really love that um, the marriage of, of Peter and Mary Jane as well. I love that annual. Uh, anyway, just as an aside, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of times a lot of them were like, oh, you know, a lot of people, especially maybe the younger readers, can't. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, you know, they can't relate. They can't relate to yeah, it. Yeah, they can't relate yeah. with a Mary and Spider Man. I'm like, why not? I'm like. You know, when I first mm. started reading it, I was like 10. I was like, oh, this is great. I love that he has, like, somebody to come yeah. to and talk to. And Yeah. I, I, I mean, I certainly will admit, though, that reading a lot of Spider-Man now, a lot of the older ones now, being a, a little older as well, um, you, you appreciate it on a different level because yeah. um, because you're, you can kind of really empathize and you can, you can really kind of see a lot of things that um, kind of parallel you know, not to say feel that I've been out with a, a supermodel or anything like that, like Mary Jane with those crazy parties. Uh, but it, it certainly does give you a different perspective as to when you when you were younger. So to that extent, I can understand that that they were saying that the readers are probably going, oh, this is bad. But what what a great way to to, to solve it, you know, mm -hmm. by having like the clone. Like this was a clone all along. Let's just like reboot and like restart. And and he doesn't have all that experience because he wasn't he wasn't there peter parker um that would have been cool but at the same point as well obviously that would have been ruffling so many spider-man fans as feathers oh um, yeah because it's basically it was yeah. basically at that point it was like yeah the guy you've been reading for the last 20 years so for a yeah. lot of people like myself included it's like yeah the guy you've been reading since you you've started reading spider-man oh yeah that was a clone yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you see the vitriol now with a lot of like, things like, I don't know, Captain America being a Hydra, <laughs> you know, um, Secret Empire. Could you imagine if that happened today? Uh, Dan Slott got, um, got death threats because of Superior Spider-Man because Doc Ock was Spider-Man for that short period of time. But it seemed like, you know, forever for a lot of fans. It's crazy. But... Um, I, I just want to say I love what these sort of write, the, the, these things that the writers do. I mean, this is exactly what they're being paid for. You, you know, they're not paid actually to 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 um, to ruffle readers' feathers. They're not paid to do that, but they're paid to explore. You know, they're paid to actually try different things. So uh, I've got to take my hats off to the likes of Dan Slott and Terry Kavanagh and Nick Spencer. You, you know, that all those sorts of writers. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's good. Oh look! <laughs> nerd, nerd. <laughs> one of us. I love Hellfire. Look, one of us. Well, he said he is the triplet. So, yes, exactly. Actually, Lilith, while you're if you're still listening here, like you know, um, big props to your last Capes and Lunatics show about the last Ronan. 
I'm totally invested now. I've been trying to find it. It's very hard to find that issue because it's been it wasn't printed enough. But um, yeah. Anyway, just wanted to give props to that. Um, great that you're loving the team. Right, team and team. What's that? Right, I'll take it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh yeah gimme gimme ah! <laughs> yeah i mean i i i yeah i know they ruffled a lot of feathers with that whole thing they were gonna make peter yeah. the and stuff but i mean i appreciated like terry was saying that they were gonna give him and mary jane a happy ending i'm like you know what we got Oy. yeah like over 10 years later when you know because just like yeah so he sells it he sells his marriage to the devil oh yeah <laughs> The uh yeah, you and Lilith uh, always point that out, eh? The uh the old Mephisto, eh? That's yeah. Crazy. Oh yeah, that that one really that one ruffled my feathers. <laughs> um Yeah, but it's also interesting as well, just with what um what Terry had mentioned. Unfortunately, a little bit of internal office politics there as well about how the editor went to Tom DeFalco a bit preemptively. Like Terry, in, in that excerpt that we listened to, Terry was saying, look, you know, this is my pitch, but don't tell, you know, don't tell Tom. I'll, I'll tell him myself. But the editor, I can't remember, whoever it was, told Tom and and maybe smeared the idea, which is why, again, maybe another reason why they didn't go down that that track. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a very, uh, it's a, it's a very big kind of a, a big idea, a big concept. So, I guess it would have been hard to 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 kind of get that across the line to begin with, but um, interesting that kind of an editor came in and whispered in Tom Tom DeFalco's ear to kind of maybe sway him. Well, yeah, th- I mean, some of them were probably nervous because I mean, Spider Man was and probably mostly still is like they're like you know like the mascot, the mate, the you yep. know flagship character. You know, if anyone knows mm-hmm. Marvel, a Marvel character, it's probably Spider Man. Yeah. Yeah, and no, absolutely. I mean, he's still going strong. He's great. I mean, you just got to even look at what they've done now. I mean, they've created a whole universe within the universe, like the whole Spider Verse. Oh, yeah. uh, all those new characters now as well, and then you have the the more traditional fans going, look, you know, this should only be Spidey and and all that. But I mean, why not? A- again, if we're looking to call, this is a, a business. <laughs> you know, they're not they're not here to write stories for our pleasure. Exactly, Lilith. Exactly, they're not they're not here to just do it all for us. They're here to make to make some coin. So you've got to try and market your your re- you know your assets as much as you can. Um, there's nothing like some big assets, Phil. <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll cut that up. <laughs> he likes big assets, and he cannot lie, Lilith. Okay. <laughs> Lilith, I know you love the lurk, but you can jump in if you want. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. All right, so should we get to this next clip? Yeah. What what's this one? I can't remember what this one was titled. Retconning and initial reactions. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, this will be the fans freaking up. Mm-hmm. Um, and but yeah, that the rest of it uh, was true, and went from you know meeting a very very resistant audience. Um, um, you know, our fellow creators, the editor, and then the editor in chief to having people so wildly enthusiastic. I think that it was at that meeting, Terry, I think that DeFalco then wound up coming on to write one, what he did spectacular Spider-Man. Uh, no, what did he do? He, he did amazing. Uh, yeah. Um, um, I, 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 I was doing adjective lists. You did web, yes. uh, Mattis was on Spectacular and Tom took over Amazing. And we got so um, uh, vocal. I don't know. You know, Terry's a bit of a a, a talker. And, you know, as Terry said, I'm very reserved. I would never. (laughs) Of course. Howard that I am. Um, But we at, at certain points in the conversation had gotten so, so vocal that uh, the um, uh, the somebody from the hotel staff. We were in a hotel conference room. Came hotel and security, actually, Howard, hotel security. Uh, yeah, um, it said you know we're getting complaints from people in the surrounding rooms 
that you guys are making too much noise. Can yeah. you keep it down? And Falco uh, stepped forward. And Tom DeFalco is a very unique character. I don't know if any of you have had the the privilege of meeting him or or talking to him, but and I'm going to go into my Tom DeFalco impersonation because it was a <laughs> on staff, and, and I've done this on panels with Tom sitting next to me. Um, uh, but Tom walked over, and Tom talks like this, and and he looked at the the, the guy and he said, "The thing of it is, we're paying for this room, and if my guys are this excited." I'm not quieting them down. So you you got two choices. You can either find us another room or find them another room because we're not shutting up. And <laughs> That's I'm like cool. they them move, so I guess they move the other people. Oh, wow. uh, but uh, the, you know, and that you know, we we so that but that's the point. We went from people saying, "Oh no, no that just sounds like another" to people being wildly enthusiastic about the 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 whole concept and how it could play out. Yeah. Um, and the disappointment for me personally was that story didn't get to be told. Right. Um, not in the way that we wanted it to. I believe so. It was editorial, right? That made Jin's, uh change course on that story then. It, yes. it was editorial being directed by marketing. Yeah. Mm. And did you yeah, and I can speak to most of this better than me because I was off the books by the time they were doing send in the clones. I mean, uh, certainly I didn't think it was a good idea. I mean, what we had was one unique clone and one human being. We had made an exception with um, Kane. We yeah. introduced him to villain that would be specific to that storyline. But the idea of sending the clones and having a cover with a thousand clones sort of dehumanized and devalued the clone that we were trying to make into a full on character a hundred percent. So yeah, that's the other thing. I th- I think that's like the strength of the nineties. I mean, I don't think they do it as much. Well today they can't do it today, but like, like they were just describing and I, th- I know they did it over at DC, like, especially with the Superman books, you know, these guys who had like three, four monthly books every month, that, like, I swear, at least once a year, the writers would get together, you know, I don't know if the artists mm-hmm. there, but the writers at least would get together and have like a little summit once a year and like plot out the year and be like, okay, you know, I'm doing the first book of the month. This is what I got to do. And then I'll get, I'll get you to here. You pick up the ball and you take it and you know. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, Marvel have have that now. Like listening to uh, Agent M, uh, Ryan Panagos on the, the this week in Marvel, they talk about all those retreats, right? You know where they do because that's sounds like to me the only chance they really do get to kind of sync things together. So I'm I'm sure they had that sort of stuff similar back in the day as well. Um, it, it's interesting to hear what Howard was saying that that their idea was was being received so well like we're talking internally you, you know um people it started to generate a lot of stuff to the point where uh tom defalco was was defending them in the hotel to actually you know to keep the creative juices going you, you know what i mean um so it lends it, it begs a question again as to why they inevitably didn't go for that story um you, you know as as you mentioned in that in that excerpt as well uh, it was um you asked the question and they said look marketing drove editorial to to do that at the end um but it, it's interesting because you have edit, editorial that seems to be um um you know amenable to that idea but marketing obviously i guess must have had the last say in it well, yeah, I think that's that they said, I know uh, they all pretty much said, yeah, you know, marketing was basically, you know, the, the nut, it kept selling and selling and selling. It's like, no, 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 you can't end it. Keep it going. Keep it going. And yeah. the whole thing with the whole change of course on Ben Riley, I think I'm trying to remember, I might've heard an interview where they thought I heard someone, maybe it was even the Falco himself. Somebody said, yeah, they switched editors, I think too. So I don't know if it's like right after they revealed he was Ben Riley was the real Spider-Man. They were like, yeah, no, we're going to, we're going to, switch switch that back at some point so it's like i don't mm. think about too far in when they are like yeah we're we're gonna go back go back to the way it was after a while so everyone was like okay then yeah yeah i wonder i wonder i mean like it's funny i just i wonder who that i want to name phil i wonder who who made that decision in marketing 
to like just keep and like it'd be interesting to actually pick their brain as to you know and what they think whether or not they are a comic book reader how they think it it has unfolded now in the greater context of spidey and this clone saga thing because you you can hear as well terry and howard they were very defensive the moment that was saying, like, let's, let's talk about clone saga oh no 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 it's terry's fault oh it's howard's fault you know they say it jokingly but it has this kind of reputation for being a, such a um, such a, a bad kind of storyline for a lot of Spidey fans, um, and it's just interesting to hear the back, you know, behind the scenes how it all happens. So I'd like to know who what it was that did make that decision and what they think of it now. Like, you know, oh yeah, I really did stuff up. It would have been good, or no, it actually made the sales that we wanted, so it was the right decision at the time. Again, we're talking about a, a business here, so uh, it's not necessarily um, in the character's best interest. It's more just to, to gain that revenue. Hold on, Ray. You know what that is? I'm about to drop another name. Uh, I've talked to Ron Friends a few times. Aww. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hit him that. Uh, Tom DeFelco are really close. I, I have I keep ah. saying I want to get like the both of them on, you know, like you had Ta Terry and Howard and like, yeah, DeFalco has all the answers. So I would like DeFalco. Yeah. DeFalco would be yeah. great. Yeah. 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 You got to get, you got to make that happen. Especially I've, be... heard, I've heard an interview with him. Yeah. He does talk exactly like this. <laughs> Was that a good impersonation? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, oh, so do you want to get to the next clip? Fan and critical reaction. So, ah, uh, yeah. So, yeah. So hang on. So um, paint the picture for me here, Phil. Though. So okay. So we're talking about. So the the moment the clone saga, literally, kind of what we're reading at the moment, was hitting the the stands and the comic book stores. It was still open, right? So it was alluding to the fact of what, where Terry and Howard wanted the story to go, but obviously the ending of it was totally different. Like they wanted Ben Riley to have been the Spider-Man since the, yeah, but it went another way. But anyway, I guess this fan reaction is to like the stories that we've covered so far in the Scarlet Spider um, about it. There being such an ambi uh, ambiguity between, Oh, is Ben Riley is, is he the Spider-Man or not? And that was enough to cause a lot of uh, kerfuffle amongst the, the, the fandom. Yeah, um, yeah, I was gonna try to pull up the schedule here. Uh, yeah, the the big reveal, it's not too much longer. It seemed like it, it seemed like it went on for a while, but yeah, I think there was more time with Ben as Spider Man than mm, okay, might be halfway. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I was trying to look up where we so the, the stuff that we're covering now might be really the, the point of when these fans were reacting, which we'll hear. Oh, yeah, because, I mean, you could tell yeah. from your reading, they were already teasing it that, you know. Yeah, huh? yeah. The real one, who's the real one? Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, our our episode at the end of March, yeah, you're going to, you, that's when we're going to get the big reveal. It's like, <gasps> okay. Ben's actually Spider-Man. Yeah. All right. Cool. Trial of Peter Parker, kids. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, let's get into fan and critical reaction. But yeah, I just wanted to ask as well. So back, because you hear about these days as well. Some some fans are crazy, right? And they start and they threaten. You know, the, you hear these death threats. Dan Slot got it with um with Superior yep. Spider Man. Did you guys get any? I mean, Terry, you mentioned that you were kind of off it towards the end anyway. But I don't know. Whether All right, hold on, pause that for a second. Uh, I yeah, I thought that, like the death threats were like a new thing, but like I forget where I heard it was probably another podcast. Like they said, I think uh. Uh, Chris Claremont, you got like death threats for like, uh, wow. you know, the Dark Phoenix saga and stuff, you know, killing Jean Grant yeah. stuff. So well, I, I guess I guess gamers and comic book fans, they love taking it to the extreme. You know, I don't just hate it. I want to kill you, which exactly. is <laughs> that's, a, that's a crazy thing. So I think it's always been there. I guess so maybe the Internet's made it, you know, easier. Unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. Right. Are there any any like massively negative um Threads Ma massively, away. massively negative fan feedback at the beginning. Wow, Mass okay. because they, they they could tell what we were writing and mm. that we were writing towards this supposed clone yeah. turning out 
the real Spider-Man. So they were honestly, rightfully resistant to that. They're like, what are you saying? Mm. You know, about the time we put in on this other Spider-Man character, totally understandable. We were prepared for that, yeah. to be honest. But <laughs> it, there is some kind of maxim that I can't put my finger on right now that, you know, any, well, any publicity is good publicity. So yeah. even though people were talking about it, they were buying it and reading it so they could bitch and complain about it. <laughs> oh yeah. So yeah. much so that age of apocalypse in the X-Men office directly stemmed out of that. The fact that we were inching our sales up while all other sales were going down, including X-Men, which Howard had referenced is why Bob Harris and his people at their X-Men conference came up with the Age of Apocalypse. There could be some kind of massive event that affected all of the X-Men books the way we had done with the Clone Saga. Yeah. Yeah, we, but in terms of the death threat thing, a couple of things. One, we the benefit we had was pretty much we were pre-maximum uh, usage of the internet yes. as uh, the vehicle. So to to threaten us or to write uh, anything negative, you know, took effort. Uh, it meant you, you, you had to actually write a letter yeah. and then find the address, which is at the bottom of every uh, splash page in, in the comic, and then put in then fold it, put it in an envelope, find the stamp, send it mm. to, you know, it, that eliminated a lot of that, yeah. that stuff. What, how, and, how about- but what about- we're where we were at a disadvantage was at that time, the major fanzine that existed was wizard magazine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't like it. And they went Uh, out of their way to, to condemn it. And it was, you know, they were, they were, uh, uh, you know, um, an opinion leader at that point. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess, you know, if they were today and they were online, they'd be considered an influencer. Yes. Um, and and it, I thought it was it was horrific that they did that. And I, you know, at one point after much of it was over, and I think when I was right, the only Spider-Man writers still standing, they had asked to do an interview with me, and I said, "Yeah, under one condition, you're going to print what I say because a lot of it's not going to be complimentary." Yeah. <laughs> uh, I believe I believe they kept most things in. Okay. Um, um, but um, I don't believe they kept it all in. <laughs> I, I guess I should have gotten it in writing. But okay. um, I but they 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 were an influencer. They you know that impacted uh, the the store owners who yeah. were placing the orders for the mm-hmm. comic yeah. as well, who also worked against their own personal interest because sometimes they would the owners or the people working behind the counter instead of trying to sell a comic would try to talk people out of, um, of getting a yeah. comic because they didn't like it. I always referred, it would be like going into a, 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 a supermarket or a grocery store and going to the person who owns it saying, Where, where's the tuna fish? Yeah. I need some tuna fish. And the guy's saying, oh, no, 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 no. I don't like tuna fish. Why don't you get some peanut butter instead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that was what, you know, that was the impact of both Wizard and and then filtered down into the, the individual comic book uh, yeah. stores yeah. as well. I mean, they're just shooting themselves in the foot, aren't they? So, yeah. um, and, well, uh, uh, Howard, I wanted to ask, what got more – what got more feedback or even like negative feedback, the revelation that Ben Riley was the real Peter Parker or later on when you were working on the reboot in 1999, when uh, Mary Jane seemed to die in a plane crash. I, no, I, would say, I mean, we were so prepared for all of it. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I, you know, I don't know again, because so much of the stuff had to come back, come through letters yeah. and I wasn't at, and I wasn't on staff. So I didn't, I didn't really get to see too many of those things. I did. I also have a, um, a habit of avoiding the, the negative stuff online once that started to become more prevalent because I could read, you know, a hundred positive reviews of, of myself or my writing and have one negative review be out there. Mm-hmm. And that's the only one I remember. Yeah. So 
I, yeah. And I remember when Paul Jenkins came on to the Spider-Man books, he had called, you know, when writers talked to each other and, and he was very active on the internet. And he said to me, Howard, how do you do it? How do you, how do, how do you do? I said, do what? He said, how do you deal with all the, the negative crap that's being, you know, said about you online and all that? And I said, Paul, I have a very, you know, very simple uh, uh, solution to that. I don't read it. Hmm. And, yeah. and, it and it's true. I mean, it's, it, you know, I love hearing constructive criticism, but as we know, 99.99999% of stuff that is blurted out on the internet or social media is anything but constructive. But yeah, I mean, yeah, Wizard was a big force back in the day. I remember that's that's pre well for me pre internet. So Wizard mm-hmm. magazine. I remember like two or three months before the end of the clone saga reading in there, like the announcement, Oh yeah, this clone saga is going to end with, you know, Spider-Man 75. We're only going to have one Spider-Man. Who's, who's it going to be? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to imagine that like this one entity had so much of an influence now. Like, uh, yeah, you and I feel know of the pretty internet days, uh, and we, uh, Wizard, I mean, w- Wizard was great. I mean, oh, you, you guys have spoken about it on the show. I, I collected it avidly as well, similar to comics, because that was where you got information. If it wasn't talking in your LCS, um, it was largely from, yeah, largely from the Wizard magazines that you caught everything. Uh, what would be the the equivalent now, Phil? It, it's not even Newsarama. I mean, they're, they're pretty cool, but they're, for me, they're, I always go to them for for um, inter, uh, comic book stuff, CBR as well. But um, Wizard Magazine was was the the summit really, and and to have them to spurn the Clone Saga um, and influence um, sellers, retailers, mm. man, that's terrible. That's terrible. But yeah, again, it was like pre you know pre internet and like how many people were talking comics back in that day? Like I. Like I've said, like I didn't have a lot of people personally in my life who were like reading comics on like a monthly basis. So it's like, yeah, I went the wizard to, to, to see in, you know initial reactions and like even at that yeah. uh, ninety four, I wasn't even like full time at L- LCS. You know, part of the time I was going still, you know, there were still spinner racks in stores. There were still newsstands. Mm-hmm. So like, yeah, I wasn't in a full time in an LCS even yet. I mean, if if I if you can indulge me and and. I put on my old man hat, Phil, as well. Funny, I, I don't know, like you were mentioning it there, I don't know if it was the same with you at high school as well, but around this time in the 90s, uh, comics were, I mean, before the bubble burst, they were at their peak. I mean, I remember um, going to high school and stuff, being a comic collector, and there were these uh, my classmates who weren't necessarily comic book fans were, they heard the news about about. I remember vividly get the number one Luke Cage, or it was just called Cage, you know, with a, a it was kind of like a shiny purple cover with Cage on the front. Get that, that's going to be big. So, <laughs> one of my classmates, he bought like five copies because this was, it, there was this madness back in the day of, of, um, of this will set us up for life, you know, we can, we can pay off our mortgages with it. Um, and, and, Everyone, it was similar to an extent to how what the MCU has done to the greater populace uh, in in opening their eyes to comic book um, culture. But back in the day, with that huge wave of of um, those those rock stars of, of Jim Lee, Rob Liefeld, Tom Tom McFarlane, um, these massive a million plus sales of X Men One and Spider Man One, it actually filtered through to to a lot of the the general population um so for me around that time it it actually was very very much in in the attention of a lot of people um but yeah uh but wizard held that kind of iron fist of of letting you know what was good what was bad uh and a lot of the i know a lot of the lcs retailers lent on that as well um on on uh wizard magazine if not I'm not sure if even previews were was out back in the day, um, but they used to read a couple of. Uh, what was the other one? Um, the Street Guide or something. Oh, there was a Bruce Street. Was that the Price Guide? Uh, yeah, yeah, the Price Guide. That was another big one. But Wizard Wizard was a lot more entertaining because they had a lot of articles and stuff. Oh yeah, and they even had. I think you know they were like, oh hey, we might get a Spider-Man movie soon, and I remember them just doing you know yeah. 
casting with like Leonardo DiCaprio as Peter Parker. Mm, mm. It was just a, it was just a really nice package, Wizard, uh, and then they started introducing cards and. Uh, was that another drop, Phil? <laughs> they started I using... God, that was another drop. <laughs> um, they started interesting cards, and as you, as you mentioned before, posters and stuff like that. So it was, it was a really, and it, it always came in that plastic, uh, plastic uh, cover. I so know. Was, uh, yeah, uh, like the plastic bag, so you couldn't open it until you bought yeah, it. Yeah, it, it was special. It was special. Oh yeah, yeah. I, think, I remember on the newsstand there was like two two mag. Well, there might have been more, but like two magazines wrapped. It was that. It was Playboy. You couldn't open them in the store. You had to buy them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can't well, leaf through that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think you you know, Wizard held power because they're actually like reporting on this stuff and like yeah, pre MCU days. Like a lot of people, you know, comics were a mystery to them. Like I knew. Yeah. I knew some kids in school, you know, they might read a comic once or twice a year. And I was just like, oh, that's it. That's it. But like, <laughs> people, yeah, yeah. People, would, you know, people would ask me about, um, you know, every so often, you know, if someone had a study hall, they'd be like, hey, man, can I borrow a comic and read it? Study hall. Like, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. So it was there. The, the yeah. interest was there. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. But a lot of people didn't know about it because I know people would be like, oh, do you have, did you get the death of Superman issue? And it was like two years before this. So I was like, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> over, like, you, I can't tell you how many people were like, "Oh yeah, my dad is like the first issue of Spider Man," or you know, or, uh, or something. But uh, the amount of people who told me this, I'm like, it can't be. This can't be true because everyone, <laughs> oh yeah, my dad is the first Spider Man. I'm like, well, you know, it would be that expensive now if everyone had it. So yeah, yeah. yeah now, my dad had all those old stuff, man. <laughs> Are you, your dad collected? Yeah, because he he collected like early Marvel because like, nice. yes. Yeah, because like you know when like Winter Soldier the movie Winter Soldier came out like he knew who Bucky was and stuff it, yeah wow wow that's so cool but I think his comics got all, all got tossed so yeah no uh, yeah. yeah 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 they didn't know what yeah. they had back then yeah yeah exactly exactly yeah all right but speaking of the nineties and stuff Ray mm -hmm. <laughs> play Terry and Howard. Ray was yeah. afraid to ask the, the most important question of the nineties. I stepped up and asked the most important question of the nineties. Mm -hmm. Who was Poseid? Oh, Lil, we have to cover this one day. That's right. <laughs> read it. Who was Poseid? Big pause. Who cut these up? Oh, I have one final question. The ultimate nineties question. I have to ask Terry. I'll never forgive myself when I'll ask this. Terry, when you were writing uh, Web of Spider-Man, uh, who was Facade? <laughs> you want my honest answer? Yes. Yes. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, I don't. I know. I knew who it was then. Yeah. But and I and it was brilliant. In fact, I remember that very clearly. It was a. It was going to be a brilliant, brilliant reveal. Uh -huh. But I now don't remember because uh -huh. you know life. Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> well, that's one of the ages I, I'd imagine, Never. or um, for a lot of head cannon, uh, for a lot of comic book fans. Phil, I'm sure you've got a few. I get asked that. I get asked that a lot, and I could lie. I probably have lied a couple of times to people, but uh, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, I I can imagine that's what Terry would, you know him saying that like he probably had a, a brilliant take on it back in the day but kind of just got put into the mental drawer at the bottom of the, of the cabinet and just forgotten and you don't get that magic back well yeah it, like i said i think in web of spider-man it was the very last story before the clone saga and you know then terry got busy with the clone saga and then he left the books and like it never got picked back up you know never got picked back up yeah. and after decades he just forgot yeah because it was a girl it was a murder mystery. I forget. Yeah, they had at least like four suspects, and it was like who you know who who put this armor on and killed. Well, spoilers. It was Lance Bannon, but who killed Lance Bannon? And it's like, yeah, yeah. At the end of the story, they never revealed who it was. You know, Spider Man takes the armor down, but whoever it is, you know, is able to sneak away out of the armor, and it's just it's never one, one for the ages. And and for those completionists. It's probably scratching at your, uh, <laughs> at your, uh, your mind. It's just weird because someone, you know, we, you never like to hear, you know, someone got away with a crime, but yeah, someone killed yeah. Lampoon and got away with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there, there were a few things, weren't there, in the um, what we've come across in the Scarlet Spider 
um, a few threads that just never seem to get wrapped up. Like, there's a whole thing. Is is it the guy? Is he called the Traveler? That the um, I can't remember. The, the who's the dude that with the with the white uh, hair and the yeah Judas Judas Traveler? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Judas yeah. Traveler. Yeah, I mean he never fruition into anything like you you mentioned i haven't read the head so yeah, yeah yeah i mean i mean he can he makes a few more appearances but then he makes like one like at the end of the clone saga and yeah that's it yeah because yeah i think that's yeah. A, yeah, everyone says it's like you know he, well the two i think you know i think he was like a character you know jam d mateus wrote that you know created the character i think he had plans for him but then by the okay. point we brought him back at the end d mateus uh, i think was he gone or he comes back after the clone saga, but yeah. So it's like, I think, I don't know if, cause I think the last appearance that Felco wrote, writes it. So I don't know if he didn't know the Mateus okay. plans or he just like wrote it different. So he's like, yes, yes, you wrote this character. So I just, yeah. Let, let's just put him back to obscurity. And also I could be totally wrong, Phil. Um, who's that dude? Uh, does he play a bigger part? The dude that um, looks like the Grim Reaper from Bill and Ted's bogus journey. Is that in in the black? Oh, the black? Scryer, Scryer, yeah, yeah, Scryer, yeah, yeah. Is anything happened there? Does he kind of fade into obscurity as well, or? Um, I think by now he has. I mean, he, yeah. See, so I, he. I mean, they. I again, I don't know if they were building him up to be like a big cosmic level figure, but it's like eventually yeah. revealed to be a, a cult of of guys, and that, mm. and eventually it's going to be revealed they're like working. I, I think it's working with or working for the true mastermind of the clone saga oh, oh okay so so they are kind of wrapped up that, yeah, that yeah, yeah. Oh, okay 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 but, but right. even after the clone saga like he's meant it's mentioned like one or two, a few other times scryer like because uh i think it's even a silver surfer annual where it's like yeah oh yeah this cult was actually based on like a big cosmic guy so oh okay they, they were still they're still pushing that angle <laughs> but yeah, 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 yeah. Didn't, didn't work at the end yeah yeah because yeah because yeah. i don't know if like you know someone maybe an editor someone was like yeah we don't need like big cosmic powered figures in spider-man <laughs> yeah they're pretty cool i mean i love spotty and the fact that he, he can, well he doesn't really go into into space that often but uh, um like every so often like back in the day you get one of those marvel team-ups where you'd like maybe team up with like yeah. the hero or something yeah yeah i mean he tussled with fire lord uh that's sort of right. in the avengers in the 90s he went to space but that was funny because he always he was he was always a fish out of water there in, anyway from memory um but yeah yeah he's a versatile character oh yeah he's the everyman yes <laughs> exactly all right, so what's the uh, this last clip? Is that, uh, is that uh... just some shout outs? I think that um, that Howard and Terry um, talking about there, but I, I don't think I've included it. So, in case I haven't, uh, anyway, w w let's play it. And in case I haven't, I have a question to you, Phil, as well. Okay, okay. yes, Howard and I have launched a company called Ink Smith, I N K S M. Y T H. We snuck the word myth in there. Um, you can find our site at inksmith.com. We create custom comic books as private commissions for clients to celebrate people that they would like to celebrate. Uh, we create a character based on their strengths, a, a villain or an obstacle or an antagonist based on hurdles they've overcome in life it becomes a very personal story it's heroicized um into a superhero story uh but it's something that the celebrant who receives the comic who is usually not the same person as the client mm -hmm. really can see that the person who commissioned this comic book for them knows them and understands them and knows what their strengths and weaknesses are and what they've overcome uh and we find we get they get a very it's very impactful for the recipient of the comic um and the person who's given it to them who's commissioned it for them usually it's exactly the response they want from them it sounds like a, a fantastic idea terry and, and howard it sounds a really good idea um what's the time frame for for completing like one about of eight weeks for a 12 page comic with okay. you know two exterior and two interior covers okay. we have access to uh almost all of the talent in the industry as i mentioned earlier i 
anybody who was around in the 80s, I used on Marvel Comics Presents. So I've worked with many, many of these people. Some of the newer people I have not, but Howard and I still one way or the other have access to that talent. I think more and more of that talent becomes available for projects like this as Marvel and DC maybe do less and publish less. Mm -hmm. More and more of that becomes available. And comic books, people have a better understanding of now, thanks to the movies, than they did previously. So not everyone who's going to commission one of these comic books is going to be a comic book fan. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to figure out a different way to celebrate their hero or their loved one in a time when they can't throw a party for them. You know, they can't get everybody together in the same room. They can put together a story about these people. And then that can go to all the people that would have been at the party once okay. it's printed. Our, our goal is to make it a, a an overall experience. What we're referring to it is a boutique um, comic book experience. Okay. And it, 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 it we're, we're trying to make it as high end as, as possible. Um, you know, it is, uh, it, there's going to be, um, um, a niche market uh, for it, but you know, we, I'm doing most of the writing mm -hmm. uh, currently, and Terry's doing all of the uh, hard work um, mm -hmm. of, of putting pulling it all together. And the end results, of, you know, we we've, we've currently we've done three currently, and we're working on our our fourth, and we have a fifth in the the pipeline, and um, it's been it's been a fun experience, I believe, for for both the client, the recipient, and certainly from Terry and my end as well. Uh, it's and like I said, the, the whole the goal is for it to be a, a boutique comic book experience. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so, and we had, by the way, Bill Sinkevich oh, did wow. one of our covers, and he's doing the cover for the one we're currently working on oh, now. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, a, a pretty, a pretty nifty adventure that Terry and Howard are, are part of. So, Inks Myth M Y T H dot com, uh, boutique comic book um, kind of services. And and Phil, I'm not sure. I can't remember if I've mentioned it to you before or someone. Uh, one of their clients was uh, was John Krasinski. People would know uh, Jim from The Office, um, from Jack Ryan. So, uh, you know, pretty big clientele and you can actually go onto the website and see the easter eggs and references and they actually explain it all uh in the comic that they did for for john krasinski so um it's, it's pretty cool stuff um yeah so i, I thought it'd be great to to give them a shout out as well i mean they're, they're um yeah providing a good a different service oh yeah and they were nice enough to talk to us yeah i'm gonna i'll put that i'll put a link to that in the show notes and uh jmd mateus is uh Mm -hmm. when, yeah, I'll put all those in the show notes. So if anyone's looking for those, uh, yeah, just scroll down. Yeah. Um, the thing I wanted to tell you, Phil, was uh, that I didn't put it in there, though, but Howard did plug it. And, and I'm not sure if it's come out yet. He did mention there was a one-shot of Vengeance, the, the character Vengeance, that was meant to come out in October. I have seen it on the League of Comic Geeks. I can't remember if it's actually been released yet or not but it's still very much a thing so i'm not sure if it's still um about to be released or it has happened it's a one shot for yeah that 90s character vengeance which howard had created and he called it uh he liked to describe it as it's the um it's like the venom to to ghost rider the same way that venom is to spidey um a really kind of cool character but um yeah you hadn't seen it on the shelves or anything phil I have no, I haven't seen it because yeah, that's one, that's uh, one of the ones yeah I would be interested in reading. So yeah, I, yeah, me I, too, me too. Yeah, I thought that character was pretty cool back in the nineties. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. But so I, I, so I didn't want to include that in the snippets just in case it had already been released because I did see it. But if it hasn't, then that's something that Howard had plugged as well, and and certainly something to look out for on your comic book uh, comic book shelves in your LCS. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, look for work from either of these gentlemen. I mean, excellent. Mm. Yeah. All right. So, anything else, Ray? Oh, nothing other than uh, I'm looking forward to the upcoming episodes of Capes and Lunatics to come up. Uh, it's uh, it's always a it's always a blast to listen to. So, uh, I've been busy reading. 
Uh, massive apologies on uh, one of the ones that you'll be recording very soon. I haven't got around to that, but I did indulge in in the upcoming um, issues on your cape, uh, comic capers episodes. Yes, yes, yes. We always appreciate the feedback, Ray. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yes. and, and, more, and more Scarlet, more Scarlet Spider episodes last Tuesday of every month. So yes, stay mm-hmm. tuned. This one's just a little different because it's the big 100th episode. So. Ah, yeah, I, I can't wait to listen to the the first half of this episode. Actually, I'll be I'll be tuning in. Uh, that should be a good chat. James Dumatius is is a great guy to chat with. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, and that's a that's a good issue. Did you read Amazing Spider Man four hundred? Uh yes, I did. Oh, I, I did. Um, like recently, but like not like in, not in the last week or so. But okay. yeah, what I, I was going to say, I was going to say, if you haven't read it, just make sure you read it before you hear the interview. Yeah, 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 for sure so so yes so yeah ray's kind of a busy man that's why he doesn't always get the feedback in uh ray <laughs> what are the many uh podcasts and people can hear you on on a weekly basis oh or at, well ray uh or at every other week basis yeah for sure uh, well i am a co-host i am ray zod i am a zod um from the last sons of krypton uh check us out uh if you can contact us on Twitter at LSK Podcast or lskpodcast.libson.com. Uh, yeah, where I, I, I co host with a, a nice chap called Connor, all things to do with Superman. It's really cool. I think the latest one that we've dropped is uh, is a Halloween special. So that was not too long ago. Uh, Superman and the House of Mystery from DC Comics presents issue 53. Go check it out. It was a lot of fun to do. Uh, also, as well, uh, I'm on another new show. It's a monthly show. Uh, it's called To Know Her Is To Fear Her, a Spider-Woman podcast. I am enjoying the hell out of that with my uh, my co-host, Saren. Uh, she is an absolute gem and a mad Spider-Woman fan. So I'm um, so, so blessed to have uh, a co-host like Saren on. And uh, we're, we're only a few episodes. Episode four is our latest where we get to chat with Carla Pacheco and uh, Pera Pere. Uh, the artist of the current and writer of the current Spider Woman podcast uh, series, uh, and also as well as Phil mentioned, I am on every every month as you're hearing it now on, on the Scarlet Spider uh, portion of the Ultimate Spider Cast. So, uh, so yep, yeah, um, if you're enjoying it, uh, I'm enjoy. I'm loving talking to, to Phil and and Matt. Uh, check us out. Tune in every end of the month, uh, and finally, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am a the co-host. I have a, a rotating uh, co-host sh- uh, roster with Into the Night, the Moon Knight podcast. It it is a weekly show, um, so just our weekly travails, all dictated by the phases of the moon. Check us out on ITK Moon Knight. That's on Twitter. Same on Instagram as well, but we also have a Facebook page and group, so um, all there. Or you can just actually just contact me directly at Ray Ray Pod. That's R E Y R E Y Pod on Twitter, and I will answer. <laughs> Whoa, that's pretty damn big. <laughs> yeah. So it is big. It is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so yes, uh, so yeah, we always appreciate the feedback. So you are a busy man. Yes. Uh, yeah, and. Uh, oh. So yes, yeah, so you got me and Lil uh, talking Jam D Matei, the D- Jam D Mateus. Then you, got, then you got me and Ray talking Terry and Howard. And stay tuned. We have one final surprise coming up. We're gonna have <laughs> kind of a blooper reel. So it's gonna be because we were gonna do a live read of Amazing Four Hundred. So I have you and me reading, and I also mm-hmm. have Charlie Esser and Moz Manzor doing like a one page read. So nice, nice. Can't wait to hear that. <laughs> all right, everyone. So yes, yeah, stay tuned for all that, and uh. Again, just come back every week for uh, Ultimate Spider Cast, and at the end of the month, Scarlet Spider with me, Ray, and uh, Matt Kona. So, until then, <laughs> swing on back. <laughs> exactly, sausage fest. <laughs>